But today we have a special treat. The heart of discipleship at the bridge and a key figure in discipling future leaders, those called into vocational ministry, and raising up freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors for the glory of God. One man who's gonna be instrumental in that process in preparing the next generation of ministers and people in the marketplace is our speaker today. You're in for a real treat. He has a deep, deep heart for discipleship. He has something from the Lord for us to hear and put into action. So without further ado, let's really show an encouraging, hospitable CBC Mountain welcome for Matt Jolly as he comes to bring the word of God this morning. Thank you. Um, it's an honor to be here. That's the best in introduction I've ever had. So I, can, I just want to take that and play it everywhere I go speak. Um, yeah, my name is Matt Jolly, and this is my family, my wife, uh, Crystal. Uh, we've been married 15 years. Uh, she probably wouldn't want me to tell you this, but she has a birthday this week, and it's a big birthday, a certain number. Uh, some people say you go over the hill, but she, she is more beautiful today than when we got married, and as you can see, we have six kids, and so she is, um, man, she's the hardest worker um, the longest hours, uh, the toughest job there is. And our six kids, Anna, uh, she's 12, Adeline 10, Cole, our only boy, is eight, Libby five, and Caitlin three. Uh, so y'all, let's just stop and y'all have a word of prayer for us right now. <laughs> Um, we're busy. Uh, our oldest five started Summit Charter School uh, this fall, which we love. I know a lot of people uh, in this church uh, have some role there. Some help start it. Some serve in different ways. Some are donors towards it. And uh, we're just honored to be a part of it and getting to know everybody there. And our kids love it. So thank you for everybody that ser serves in uh, Summit uh, Charter School. You know, there's a picture going around the Internet. You may have seen it. But uh, the caption, there's several different captions, but I love the caption that says, uh, the husband comes home and he walks in the door and he sees this. Where's that next picture? <laughs> and he says to the wife, what happened? And she said, well, you know how you ask me what I do all day when you're at work? And the husband said, yeah. And she said, well, I didn't do it today. <laughs> <laughs> so... That's, that's how it feels sometimes at our house. Uh, to all you moms out there, we know that y'all have the toughest job uh, there is, and thank you for that. Um, as Gary said, the vision service last week was awesome. Um, just the worship was so powerful. Uh, for those of you who uh, came, it may have been a little loud for you. That's kind of how they do it there with the college students. I love the simple worship this morning. Man, that was awesome. Thank you all for that. That, that was just powerful as well. Um, Gary's message, man, so compelling, talking about leaving a legacy, passing on what God has given to us, and six people coming to know Christ. I mean, just standing up right there and saying Jesus is Lord, and 13 people baptized after the service. Um, it, it was awesome, you know, and... It was special to be a part of. Part of what Gary talked about is he said, really, you know, none of us were supposed to be there, right? Gary is supposed to be selling insurance somewhere. Josh, his mom should have aborted him, and there never would have been a bridge church uh, without Josh. Uh, the students, you know, if you look at the stats, as Gary said, they're supposed to be hung over and still in bed, but here's hundreds of them getting up every Sunday morning and worshiping the Lord. And today I want to tell you the story of how we weren't supposed to be there either. Um, and if you don't know after this service that God is up to something big, he's up to something big between this church and the Bridge Church, and that he's raising up and bringing the people that he wants to not, not just impact Western Carolina, but campuses all across the U.S., then, then I don't know what else can convince you. Uh, you see, 10 years ago, my wife and I left uh, a comfortable ministry job in St. Petersburg, Florida. 
uh, where uh, we were loved and supported. I had a role with the Tampa Bay Rays as a team chaplain. Just a, a lot of g- great families there that loved us. But the God, God put on our heart that we were to disciple college students. And so we left all that and we sent out letters to our friends and family and said, hey, we're going to start this discipleship ministry at Mississippi State, which is my alma mater where I graduated from. We started raising support and started getting people behind us. A lot, a lot of those friends from St. Petersburg became supporters of our ministry. And we went to Mississippi State and we just got on campus and we started meeting students. And we started asking them if they knew what discipleship was and started explaining that it's, it's helping someone grow in their faith and come to maturity in their faith. And the Lord just started opening doors. He opened doors uh, for students that we were meeting with on campus. Uh, he opened doors for me to be the chaplain for the Mississippi State baseball team and get to start discipling some of the coaches uh, and players there. And our ministry was, was really successful. Uh, we were seeing tons of people come to know the Lord, uh, grow in their faith, start discipling others. And we never thought we would leave. Uh, we, we, Mississippi, Starkville was really my home. Uh, that's where I went to college. Uh, my parents were an hour away. Crystal's family was an hour away. We had our kids there. That's where we wanted to raise them. But the Lord just started doing something uh, that we weren't expecting. Uh, In 2015, uh, the two assistant coaches that I had really spent five years discipling and pouring my life into, uh, they both became head coaches that year. One went to the University of Auburn, one went to the University of Kentucky. And even though they asked me to go with them, I just felt the Lord was telling us to stay at Mississippi State. And we stayed there and continued working with the team and Halfway through that next fall, um, the University of Florida. We got any Gator fans in here? All right. Well, y'all took our athletic director, Scott Strickland, who is a good friend of mine, and that led to our head baseball coach, John Cohen, becoming the new Mississippi State athletic director. And so that led to a new head coach at Mississippi State and new assistant coaches. And I don't know if you've read in the book of Genesis uh, and going into Exodus, it talks about Joseph. And Joseph and his brothers, basically, his brothers were really jealous of Joseph and they sold him into slavery. And he ends up going down into Egypt and through uh, just a God-ordained series of events, he rises up to power. He becomes the second in charge of all of Egypt, you know, brings his family down there. And eventually in Exodus, at the first part of Exodus, it says, eventually a new king arose who didn't know about Joseph and didn't know about his works. And pretty much that was, that was the end of that position of the Israelites having favor with the Egyptians. And when this new coach came, he, he just really wasn't too interested in having a chaplain. Uh, he wasn't interested in spiritual things, being a big part of the team. He, you know, just, just to put a long story short, he just started ignoring me and uh, wouldn't schedule chapel and, and wouldn't do the things that the other coaches were, were doing. And so, I mean, it, I just got the, you know, the picture that he didn't want me there. So I continued to meet with a couple of the guys that I had still been meeting with and uh, continued doing that. But the Lord was closing that door. Uh, for my role with the Mississippi State baseball team. At the same time, I started helping this ministry get started in Starkville, Mississippi, and it was uh, a really awesome ministry that was going to build apartment complexes and disciple students and partner with churches and have mentors. And it's a great ministry, but when you become in charge of a ministry that's going to do all of that, you don't get to disciple students. You get to uh, meet with the uh, uh, board of directors and the city council and the planning people and the mentors. And before I knew it, I was spending 80% of my time doing administrative stuff and 20% of my time meeting with students. And so my spirit was growing restless. And I was just trying to figure out w- what the Lord was doing. He was closing these doors. We didn't have a... Have a just a piece about the position I was in. But at the same time, we never thought we were going to leave Starkville. That wasn't, that wasn't even on our radar. We just, our church had talked about us coming on board with them, taking over their college ministry. Uh, s- several other ministries were asking us to do stuff. 
And we were, so much so, we were looking for a bigger house at the time. We had a three-bedroom house, and with six kids, my wife is like, this ain't working, okay? We got to get something bigger. And so we had looked around and just figured the, the best thing to do was to add on. And so we had a contractor come look at it, give us uh, some initial plans and an estimate. And we were up one morning, we were having our quiet time, just kind of separately praying. And she said, hey, Um, I'm writing this check today for the contractor so he can get started. And when she said that, I just had the most restless feeling in my spirit. I mean, I I just, I I can't explain it, but when she said it, there was no peace in me. And I said, I don't, I don't have a peace about this. She's like, are you serious? Like, we've been talking about this, like, this is the plan. And, And I said, I don't, I just don't have a peace about it. And she said, well, what are we gonna do? And when she said that, and I know it was the Holy Spirit, this thought came to my mind with the most peaceful feeling that, that I had had in a couple of years. And it was just this thought that said, you're not supposed to stay in Starkville. And I looked at my wife and I said, I don't think we're supposed to stay in Starkville. And she was like, are you serious? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't know if I'm serious, but I think that I, that I just felt the Holy Spirit say, we're not supposed to stay in Starkville. And she said, well, where are we going to go? And when she said that, this thought came to my mind, Western Carolina University. I said, I think we're supposed to go to Western Carolina University. She's like, are you serious? She was like, where is that? And I'm like Googling it. And I'm like, Western? I was like, Kulawi, Kulawi? And, and she's like, you better not be messing around. Like, I was like, I don't know. I don't know if this is from the Lord. I was like, but, you know, I, I feel like the Lord is leading us there. And so we both started praying about it. She was praying for a bigger house and more land. I was praying for a church that would uh, just embrace the idea of discipleship. And, and because what I had seen in Starkville for all these years is no church had really embraced the idea of it. It was more for missionaries and campus ministries, but it wasn't for the church. It was, it was for other people. And so I want to talk to you a minute about discipleship. That's what you've heard me say. I want to tell you what it is and why it's so important and why the Lord brought us here and what the next steps are. We all know Matthew 28, 19, and 20. It says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now let me break this down, okay? So the first part is to go and make disciples. Or if you take it in its literal meaning, it's as you are going, make disciples. So it doesn't necessarily mean go off to some distant town or distant country, although it can mean that. It just means as you're going in your everyday life. You're sharing the gospel. You're telling people about Jesus. And when someone comes to know Jesus, guess what? You made a disciple. All right? So let's see. <clears throat> Is there, are those, that next slide up about uh, go and make disciples? So, so go and make disciples. That's what we would call evangelism. That's sharing the gospel and bringing lost people to get saved. And then after they're saved, the next step is you baptize them. Go ahead and go to that next slide. You baptize them. That is a public profession of their salvation. That's what we did last week. And then, this is the hard part. You teach them to obey all that I have commanded you. Now, what the church has really focused on over the years, and and it is important, is the sharing the gospel, bringing people to know Christ, and baptizing them. But where they have fallen off is to teach them to obey. And we all know, hey, with our six kids, it was a whole lot easier and more exciting to have them. It's a whole lot harder to to be with them every day and to teach them and help them grow into maturity and be responsible, you know, young men and women. And so when, when I say discipleship, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about taking a believer 
and who is immature in their faith and helping them grow to maturity in their faith. Well, how do we do that? We share our life with them, experience our wisdom, and most importantly, God's word with someone over a period of time for the purpose of helping them grow in their faith. Last week, uh, Gary said, you get a mantle, and he was talking about passing on one thing to another. You get a mantle by life-on-life experience, by getting to know someone, by watching them live, by talking about life, getting into the Word together, by sharing in the fruits of the Spirit. You take a mantle from one person to another by a relational and mutual respect, usually one older and one younger, one more experienced, one less experienced. It's hands-on. It's experiential. It's not just a talking head. And one of my favorite books uh, is called The Master Plan of Evangelism. And it said, what we need is not better programs or better methods, but better men and women who know their Redeemer from personal experience. Men and women who see his vision, feel his passion. Men and women who are willing to be nothing so that he might be everything. Men and women who have been trained and equipped by older Christians to be able to carry out the Great Commission. And so this, this happened to me the summer after my senior year of college. I was, I mean, junior year of college. I was at Mississippi State, and this Christian camp came around. They went to a lot of colleges uh, across the U.S. and recruited college staff for their summer positions, and it's called Canacuck. It's a Christian uh, athletic camp in Branson, Missouri, and me loving sports. It seemed like the perfect fit, and so I interviewed, and I got hired to work there, And even though I had grown up in church, I had done youth group, I had done summer camp, I had had done everything that our church had, Bible study programs, and had been three years into college and different college ministries. When I got to this camp, there was an older man that took me and a few other guys, and he met with us every week. And he started teaching us how to study the Bible for ourselves. He started... uh, Uh, memorizing scripture with us and setting certain verses that we had memorized. He started intentionally asking how we were doing uh, with, with our different struggles in our life and give us encouragement and accountability. And he would, we would get up early and he would take us out to go do fun stuff together and hang out. And he, we did that every week for the whole summer for about, for about 12 weeks And at the end of the summer, I mean, I had grown so much, and obviously I was leading kids and getting to be a counselor and and doing all of that was helping as well. But at the end of the summer, he said, hey, do you know what we've been doing all summer? And I was like, "Um, yeah. He said, well, it's called discipleship. He said, this is what Jesus did with his disciples. He took a few and he spent time with them and he poured into them and he taught them and he gave them this life, their life. He said, you go back to Mississippi State and you find somebody to disciple you for your senior year. I went back to Mississippi State and I go to uh, the BSU and I ask somebody there and they're like, well, we have some small groups or some Bible studies and go to the church I went to. And they said, well, we got some small groups and some Bible studies. I said, no, no, no. This is different than small groups and Bible studies. This is someone older intentionally sitting with me and a few other people, teaching us, asking us questions, helping us grow in our life. And I went through that whole senior year, and there, there was nobody there. I couldn't find anybody to disciple me. And that's, that's when the Lord really put on my heart to go back to Starkville, to go back to Mississippi State and do college ministry. And so speaking of Jesus, let's just look at him as our example for a few minutes. This is at the beginning of Jesus's ministry. This is in Mark 3.14. Go ahead and pull that one up. And so when he is choosing his 12, it says he appointed 12. And a lot of people miss this, but it says he appointed 12 that they would what? Be with him. That, that was crucial. They had to be with him. They had to spend time with him. They had to see him. They had to see the way that he was going to treat people. 
the way that he was going to sacrifice, the way that he was going to serve, the way that he was going to love. It had, it had to be something that they saw. Um, you may have heard this. Uh, it, it's, I didn't come up with it, but it says, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one should walk with me than merely tell the way. The eye is a better pupil, more willing than the ear. Fine counsel can be confusing, but examples always clear. And the best of all preachers who are men who live their creeds. For to see good put into action is what everybody needs. I soon can learn to do it if you let me see it done. I can watch your hands in action, but your tongue too fast may run. And the lecture you may deliver may be very wise and true, but I'd rather get my lessons by observing what you do. And that's why Jesus had to have them with him. They had to observe him. They had to see that it was more than just information, that it was more than just knowledge. And so at the end of Jesus' ministry, he's praying for these 12 men. He knows that he's going to the cross and he's getting ready uh, to leave them. And he knows what's ahead of them. And go ahead and go to that next slide. He prays this. He said, I have manifested your name to the men that you gave me out of this world. For the words which you gave me, I have given to them. And they received them and I have given them your word. And then he prays this prayer, and I get every person that I disciple to memorize. It's John 17, 17. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And so not only was he with them, giving them his life, he was giving them God's word. He was showing them the truth. He was showing how it intersected with their lives and their decisions and what they were doing. Uh, What about Paul? Let me just read a couple of these verses from Paul. This is in 1 Thessalonians 2, 7 through 12. It says, We prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, so that's God's word, so that he, he did impart to them God's word, but our own lives as well, because you had become very dear to us, just as you know how we were exhorting, encouraging, and imploring each one of you as a father would his own children. Just in in these passages, he uses the words a father and a mother. We gave you our life. We didn't just give you God's word. You know, you may have heard this said, and and I had a guy tell me in St. Petersburg, he was uh, on our ministry board. He said, you know what? He goes, I used to tell my kids, don't do as I do, do as I say. And one day I realized that was the stupidest advice I could have ever given them because they were doing everything I did. It didn't matter what I said. And so Paul is giving them his life and he's giving them God's word. And he says in uh, Colossians 1.28, it says, we proclaim him, Jesus, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that, here's Paul's goal, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Toward this goal I labor. I want you to think about that. Paul's goal wasn't just to get people saved. The goal that Paul labored to was to present every believer mature in Christ, right? We planted a big garden this year. It was really exciting when we tilled up the ground and we took the tomato seeds and we put them in the ground. And when we saw that first tomato plant come up through the ground, that was awesome. But we didn't just want a little tomato plant. We wanted tomatoes. We wanted fruit. We wanted maturity. And that's the Great Commission. Go and make disciples baptize them and teach them to obey. Bring them to maturity. That's what Paul focused on. If if that wasn't the focus, we wouldn't have uh, any of the New Testament after the book of Acts. Uh, Everything after the book of Acts is written to believers to help them learn to obey and grow. Um, The thing about discipleship is it leaves a legacy 
If you want to talk about legacy, let me just define legacy. Doing something that makes a difference or an impact in someone's life, in a, in a person's life or organization that continues after you're no longer around. So after you leave, whatever you did is continuing to bear fruit in, in some way, either in an organization or in some person's life. And this is a, a, a really popular verse for discipleship and uh, our discipleship group in Starkville. We called it Project 2-2, and it came from this verse. 2 Timothy 2-2, it says, the things you learn from me, so that's Paul to Timothy, so that's one generation, in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men, so Paul to Timothy, Timothy to faithful men, who will be able to teach others also. So we've got a legacy here. We've got four generations of people continuing to teach, continuing to disciple. I told you that I got introduced to discipleship that summer after my senior year or before my senior year at Kennecott, but it was, it was just a few months. When I took my first job as a youth pastor in St. Petersburg, Florida, I drove uh, from Mississippi to St. Pete. It's about a 12-hour drive. And I was just praying the whole time, God, please give me somebody who can disciple me. I, I, I saw how important it was. I saw how much I grew. I just prayed, God, please give me somebody to disciple me. And the first week there, I'm at a middle school football game that some of the kids in our ministry are in. And this older man comes up to me and introduces himself. And he says, uh, I'm Tim Cole, and I'm a pastor in the area, but um, each year I disciple a few young men. He says, that's something you'd be interested in. I just hugged him, and I was like, I've been praying for you. I, I, I prayed for you all the way down here. And that started a six-year relationship of every week being in the Word together, being in his house, seeing the way that he loved his wife and served his wife, seeing the way that he raised his kids. Go ahead and show uh, that picture. And it's kind of interesting that of all the days that the Lord would choose for me to come here and share this with you would be today for several reasons. One, you know, Gary really didn't even know me or anything about me when he called me a month ago and asked me to come. But as we got to know each other and he gave the vision rally service and we started talking about what the next steps were for the Bridge Church, here I am to tell you that the next steps for the Bridge Church is discipleship. And I'm here to tell you that today I stand before you because what's really interesting is tomorrow morning, I fly out of Asheville and I fly to St. Petersburg, Florida. And I get to go back there and I get to spend some time with the pastor that discipled me. And not only do I get to spend time with the pastor that discipled me, I told you when I was a chaplain for Mississippi State Baseball, the first year I worked with them, I told all of them on the team what discipleship was. I said, I'll be here to lead chapel on Sunday and, you know, be around if you guys need anything, but I really want to disciple some of you. So if any of you want this, just let me know. Well, one guy of 40 guys on the team came up to me and he said, man, I need somebody to disciple me. And I started meeting with him each week and we started studying the word and talking about life. And he was a senior. And by the end of that year, even though he had pitched in the College World Series and had all these accolades, he said, he looked at me during one of our meetings, he said, I haven't made one impact for Christ in my four years of college. He said, I haven't shared the gospel with one of my teammates. I haven't led a Bible study. Now, all I've been doing is pursuing, you know, the uh, major league career. I've been trying to get the most awards. I've been trying to get everything that I can. You know, Jesus said, don't store it for yourself. Treasures on earth where moth, rust, and thieves can break in and steal. When you think about that, that's all material things. He says, store up treasures in heaven. Well, what does moth not destroy? That's clothes. Rust, that's anything. Metal. Thieves, they can steal anything. It's people. It's people. That, that's what God's taken to the next generation. It's, it's people. And he hadn't invested in anybody. And as the Lord would see it, this was the smartest guy I had ever met with to this day. He played baseball. He was a mechanical engineer. He had a 4.0. The, 
the, the first week we started memorizing scripture, I said, pick, pick one of these verses in James. That's what we were studying, memorize one of these verses. Well, he came back the next week. He said, man, it was so good. I just memorized the whole chapter. I'm like, <laughs> what? I mean, that's how smart he was and how, how much he picked up on things. I said, well, you, God gave you one more year of college. By his grace, he gave you one more year. And this is what you need to do. You need to go find four freshmen. You need to go find some freshman guys on that team. And you need to ask them if you can disciple them. And so he went and found four guys that were coming to Bible study. And he said, hey, can, can we meet each week? And you guys come over to my house and we'll do some Bible study and discipleship stuff. And he took those four guys and he started discipling them. And those four guys caught a vision for discipleship. And they started sharing the gospel and discipling other guys on the team. And come 2013, when we were playing for the national championship, there's 28 guys on that team getting discipled or discipling somebody. And so tomorrow, not only do I get to go see the Paul to me, I get to go see two of those guys. One of those guys is the first baseman for the Tampa Bay Rays. If you check the headlines this morning, he hit a walk-off home run in the 11th inning to beat the Red Sox last night. His name's Nate Lowe. Another one of those guys is a pitcher for the New York Yankees. They're playing each other this week. And so I'm flying down there to get to spend time with the person that discipled me and the people that I discipled and who they discipled. But God has closed that door and he has brought me here. Of all places, Western Carolina University, in the middle of Cullowee, middle of nowhere. Cullowee's in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and you know what I prayed when God put this on my heart? I prayed for a church that would see that discipleship is needed in the church. And when I called Josh, it's a I can't even get into the story of how I got in touch with Josh. There's stories after story of, of God being in this. And I said, man, I think the Lord's leading us there and he, to do discipleship. He said, man, we need it. He goes, but we ain't got no money. <laughs> I said, don't worry. We're full-time missionaries. We raise our own support. We know that this is where God is leading us. He'll provide for us. And he was like, when can you get here? And so we came up here and and. It's, we're just the piece of the puzzle that the Bridge Church needs. They've had a thousand people give their life to Christ in the past six years, but there hadn't been any discipleship. And so what we're trying to start is that whole discipleship process that will go through the whole church and the whole campus and, and get established on this church. So when we do plant other churches that are all on college campuses, they aren't just bringing people to Christ, but they're bringing people to grow in their relationship with Christ to maturity so they can be like Greg Houston, that one person that saw that he needed his life to count for something, that he needed to leave a legacy that was bigger than what he did on the field. And not only do I get to see them, there's about 10 families there when we uh, left that uh, believed in what we were doing, and they have been supporting us financially these past 10 years. And when you read the book of Philippians, Paul talks about, to the Philippians, their participation in the gospel. Uh, and it's really exciting for me because Nate got us uh, field passes for BP, and we're going to get to go to the game, and I get to, to take not only the pastor that discipled me, but the, the people who gave to make all of this happen and say, here's the fruit of your investment. You get to see it. Thank you. Thank you for investing in me. I want to thank you. I want to share Philippians 4, 15 and 17 and close with this. It said, For no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek the profit that increases to your account. This is Paul talking to the Philippian church, saying, y'all have been the main church that has supported me in my ministry. When Josh was explaining to me the relationship of CBC and how that came about, and how you guys have given over $300,000 over the past three years to help that church become what it is. I mean, I haven't been here, but I just want to say thank you. 
thank you. You have shared in everything that has happened at the Bridge Church up until this point. Those 1,000 people coming to know Christ, you shared in that. You invested in something. You're leaving a legacy. And now I'm here to help that legacy become even more through discipleship. And we, we need you now more than ever. So today, obviously this wasn't really a message for salvation. Uh, but if you don't know the Lord, that's where you got to start. You got to understand that you have to put your faith in him. And it talks about being born again. And maybe you do know the Lord. Maybe, maybe you need discipleship. I'm in Cashers every Wednesday and Thursday. I'll give you my phone number. We can start meeting. Some, some people in this church can start meeting. Maybe you want to give to help this vision further and grow. The, the invitation can be any of those. So as I close this in prayer, I know in just a minute, there's just going to be a time to come up front and pray. If you want to pray about any of those things, I'll be here. My friend Austin, uh, he came uh, to be with us today. Uh, some others, if you need prayer, that's what we're going to be here for. So let me just close this in prayer. Dear Lord, we just, uh, we thank you. We thank you for bringing us here. As Gary said, none of us were supposed to be there last week. We couldn't have come up with this plan. I couldn't have strategically thought of coming to Western Carolina. I couldn't have thought of an amazing, generous church like this to partner with and to share with. I couldn't have imagined I'm flying to St. Petersburg, Florida tomorrow to see the man that discipled me and the people that supported me and two of the guys that I got to disciple play Major League Baseball. It, it, it wasn't my plan. It was your plan. This is your plan, God. We give you the glory. And we know that you're up to something big here in Western Carolina. And we just pray that you would give us wisdom, that you would give us vision, that you would give us provision, as Gary said, without division and revision, to come up with the right people, the right plan, the right resources to reach this next generation, not just to bring them to know Christ and baptize them, but to help them to grow to obey all that you have commanded us. In your name I pray, amen.